Okay, okay, let's start. So today's attendance is very terrible. I think it's because of the assignment one deadline. They are they were overnight and then they can't get up to attend the tutorial. Anyway, we'll talk about three topics today. Uh, first of all, I will talk about the iframe player API. I will continue from what we stopped. Um, and then I will talk about the overview of assignment two. Uh, I will talk about the server side programming. And then I will talk about the Node.js programming part. Because assignment two will be using Node.js to develop. And don't worry if you can't see the spec yet, because the specification is already finished. But Mo is too busy to update the link. So if you are if you want to start uh, start the implementation of assignment two today, then you can go to this URL. So how to get this link? You go to assignment one, and then change the URL from assg1 to uh, assg underscore new. Then you can get the specification of assignment two. Very simple. Uh, basically, what I have covered uh, matches what the specification talks about. So, so you can refer to the tutorial slides to see how to implement this uh, application. Um, okay, so so we stop from we stop at this page last week. Um, last week we talked about how to use the iframe API to do play, pause, stop, mute, and unmute, and and now I'll talk about how to implement fast forward and rewind. So this function is a little bit tricky because in YouTube iframe API they do not provide a function call to to fast forward and rewind directly, but they provide a function called seek to. So what is seek to? It is used to uh, uh, seek to a specific time in the video. So let's say you want to seek to the second, uh, the third, uh, the three seconds of this video, then you call player dot seek to and then pass three here. Three represents the uh, the time in the video, and then pass two here. This is to allow or disallow the player to seek beyond the currently buffered portion of the video. So for simplicity, just set it to true, then it's, it will be okay. And you can also use the get current time to get the elapsed time of the currently playing videos in seconds. So if you want to seek to the, uh, if you want to fast forward, then you go to the current time plus two. So our specific our specification requires that uh, when you click the fast forward button, then the player seek to the current time plus two. So this is our requirement, just follow it. And this is a pseudo code. First, when you click the fast forward button, then get the current time and then plus two. And then call player.seek2 to, to jump to the two seconds later. And if you click uh, the rewind button, then Similarly, get the current time and then current time minus two and seek to this this time and and you get you you get the rewind function. So you can see a quick demo. This is a countdown timer and it heat weight is very high. I don't know why. It's that high. I don't know why. And then uh, I will use this video for in the demo. And what do I want to test? I want to test that your rewind and fast forward function is right. So I pause it. Now it is uh, this time and I click fast forward. Then it jumps to two seconds later. Because this is this is a countdown timer, so the time decreases. I can keep decreasing it. Oh. And then uh, backward, this is rewind function. And you can see that the time difference is two seconds. So this is what we expect. And we make an assumption to make your implementation simpler. That is, uh, when I click the fast forward button or the rewind button, this assumption is always true. So the current time is always larger than two, and the current time is always smaller than the video length minus two. This is to ensure that when you call this function, this time is valid. If the current time is less than two, then I click rewind, then 
this will become a negative number, then, then the behavior is undefined. We don't need you to handle this case, so we make this assumption. And of course, you are welcome to, to handle this case. This is uh, actually very simple to handle. And the next function is next video and previous video. Uh, in the iframe API, there's a function called next video and previous video, but don't use it because this is to this is for loading and playing the next or previous video in YouTube playlist. So this is a this is an example of YouTube playlist. The playlist is in the YouTube, not managed by your application. So this is a uh, this is different from what we want. We want a playlist that is managed by your app. So we don't use this function. Instead, we use player dot low video by ID. And you can see the pseudo code to get the idea. When I click the next video button, then I read from the playlist. Assume that the play we store the playlist in our in an array called the playlist, and this and this array store all the video IDs of your playlist. So I read the current index plus one. Uh, the playlist uh, and then get the video ID. This is the video ID, and then I call player.low video by ID to change the current playing video to this one. Okay, and then I update the, the current index of the player because I click, ne I click next video so the index is incremented. And if you click the previous video button, then you go to the then you use minus one index of instead of plus one, and and remember to update the current index of the playlist. So this is the pseudo code of the of the implementation of next video and previous video, and you need to change it to JavaScript version, and uh, you need to handle a case that uh, maybe this maybe this element does not exist because you are already in the last video in the playlist, so you need to handle the case. Or if you are at the first video of the playlist, then you click previous video should have no no uh, no response because you are already at the first video of the playlist. So you need to handle this case. And the next feature we want is uh, the player. The player should play the next video in the playlist when the when the player finish is uh, finish playing the current video. So for example, when I when I uh, let's say I'm playing the first video in the playlist, and the ver first video is ended, then your player should play the next video in your playlist. That is the second video in your playlist. So the the it and uh, so the player should play the next video in the playlist automatically. It should not involve user user interaction. So how to how can we detect that a video has stopped playing? So we can use the event listener. So if you if you still remember last week when we create our YouTube player, we have a, a, a we have the event listener here. So I now I want to handle the event called on stage change, and this is my event listener. And inside my event listener, this is my event listener. It uh, it it uh, requires a parameter called event. And you can read from event.data to see what is the event's content. So now I want to detect that the YouTube player has finished its, uh, its video playback. So I handle this case. And in so here, you need to load the next video in the playlist when the current stage of the player is ended. OK, so, so you can put next video function call here. Then the then the player will automatically play the next video in the playlist. And you are welcome to handle the other events. But, uh, but I don't think it is required. OK. And the next part is about the responsive uh, uh, behavior of your, of your application. So when the device width is below empty or large, that is in the mobile view, because we have a mobile view and a desktop view, and the player should only be displayed in the desktop view. So when the player, when your application is now not at desktop view, 
then you need to destroy the player. So the meaning is that uh, when when the application is at mobile view, then the player should not be displayed and the user should not know the existence of the play player. So you think of this sentence and and I will I will uh, test this case. So how do I detect that? Detect whether a play player is still existing. You can think about this. And last year, a lot of students lost masks because they do not really destroy a player when the when the application is at mobile view. So think about this carefully. And to destroy a player object, you call this function player dot destroy. And when the player uh, when the application is restored to desktop view, then you need to recreate the player object again because instead of desktop view, you need to have a player. And so how can we detect that the application is at desktop view or mobile view? You use this uh, uh, value. So this is window.innerWidth. It re returns you the current width of the browser window. So you can detect this. And you can also use an event listener to detect the resize event in window. So when you resize the browser, then this event is triggered. So you can add, a, add an event listener to the window object and and every time the user resize the window you will be your event listener will be triggered. And, and how can we know that the browser is currently as desktop view? You can check whether window.innerWidth is larger or equal to 992. And this is Using raw JavaScript to implement, you can also use jQuery to implement. You're welcome to use it because we don't have any any restriction on the JavaScript libraries you can use. You can use anything. So this is the pseudo code of the implementation. You add an event listener to to window, and the event is called resize, and this is the fun, uh, the the event listener. And first, you check the current width. If it is larger that larger or equal to 992, that is the desktop view. You need to display the video player, and if if not, if this uh, condition is not true, then you destroy the player and set the reference to null to indicate that the player is not existing. Okay, so this is the reference I use in the slides, and you can see the demo on this page. So this is the end of this set of slides. Now we go to the next set of slides. So this is about the R72 overview of the surface eye. And let's start with the workflow. So what will happen between the clients and server? So this, these are the client and this is the server. We need to deploy our application on Heroku. So first, the client connect to your application using this URL. And then the server knows that this is a new client and it generates a new session number for you. So this is my new session number and the server redirects the client to this page. And it also sets up a, set up a, a web socket connection with the server. This is for, for sending the control signal. And I will talk about this later. So the WebSocket connection is, is established. And okay. And the next step is to retrieve the playlist from the server because our playlist is stored on the server. So so the client need to retrieve it, retrieve it from the server. And you can notice that the client actually stores nothing. The playlist is on the server. And later, a remote client connects to the same session using the same URL. So this is the URL the, the desktop client currently at. Yeah, this one. I, I will send this. This mobile client will use this URL to log into this session. So it goes to this page and it also establish a WebSocket connection with the server. Set up a connection and then Retrieves the playlist from the server, and this 
playlist should be exactly the same with this one. And now suppose that the desktop client adds or removes a video in the playlist. This action needs to be synchronized with the mobile client and server such that the playlist on both sides are identical. So when I add a new item to the playlist, the playlist in the mobile client should also be updated. And you can use the WebSocket connection to do so, or you can use other way. You, you may use RESTful API or some, some other things. It's, we do not have any restriction on that. And on the other hand, when the mobile client adds or removes our videos uh, in the playlist, it needs to be synchronized with the desktop client and server. So, so on the server, the playlist is updated, and on the other clients, the playlist is also updated. And the next part is about remote control. When the mobile client type the play button or some other buttons, uh, it sends a message to the other client with the same session number by leveraging the WebSocket connection. So when the mobile client click play button, then it sends the control signal to this client. And if there are any other clients, no matter if it's, uh, if it's a desktop client or mobile client, it doesn't matter. The mobile client broadcast this control signal to other clients within the same session because all these clients are in the same session. The session number is 440. So all of them receive the same set, same signal. And if the session number of a client is different, then this signal should not be sent to this one. Okay, because the session number is different. And if the desktop client click a button on the control panel, it also broadcasts the message to all other clients, including itself. So when the desktop client click the play button, then if local video player is will start playing videos. But since the mobile client do not do not have a video player, so the message is simply ignored. Okay, that's the end of the workflow. And about the server side implementation, what you need to do, you need to do two things. The first thing is about routing. So uh, the, when a client enters the page without session number, so this is a URL without session number, the server generates a unique session number for this client because, it's, because it is a new client. So it needs to have a new session number. And then the server will redirect the client to the page representing the session. And this is the URL I, I, I set up. You can use other formats of the session number or other formats of the URL. Just refer to the spec to see what is our requirements. So this is routing. The next thing you need to do is message forwarding. Uh, this, is to, this, uh, this is for broadcasting the control signal of the remote control and also uh, for updating the playlist. So for all the clients in the same session, all the control signals are, are when the mobile client sends a control signal, then all other clients within the same session receive the same signal. And this signal will not be sent to other clients in other sessions because different sessions should work independently. And this is, a, this is an important part in our assignment. We want to separate different sessions. So you need to make sure that you handle the message forwarding part carefully. And for the implementation, what you can use. For the routing part, you need to use Node.js or Express. And for message forwarding, you can use Socrates IO to, to set up the WebSocket connection. It is very easy to use library and we will cover all these things in this tutorial and the next video, next tutorial. And to store the playlist of each session, you can use MongoDB or MySQL database and both of them are provided in Heroku so you can use them for free. And to retrieve the playlist of each session, you have different ways to do so. 
you can use this uh, socket IO connection or you can use RESTful APIs. So after this tutorial, you can you should be able to finish the UI design, player, and control logic because all these things are, are on the front end. And for the back end part, for the server side, we will cover Node.js in this tutorial and the next tutorial, and we'll cover Socket IO in next tutorial. And remember to deploy your Node.js application on Heroku. We'll also cover that later. So this is the end of this set of slides, and I remember that uh, I need to make an announcement. So it's about the lecture and tutorial schedule. First, next week, next first day tutorial is cancelled because it has changed to project meeting. So you don't need to come here next next week. And also this week, you don't need to come as well because it is also changed to project meeting. So we lost two sections of tutorials. So where is it? It is here. It replaces the lecture time because Mo is not Mo cannot uh, conduct the regular lecture. So I use his time to conduct the two hour to conduct a two, two hour tutorial section. So I will see you on this day. And what will we cover? Uh, so this is the schedule. We have, we again have a lot of things to cover. First, I will continue on the Node.js path and then Express Web Framework. And I will talk about how to use WebSocket and Socket.io to implement interactive application. And most probably, I, we will not have enough time to cover this. And um, so you need to study the slides yourself. It's, it, it basically is a, it's a, a, a lot of screen capture and a lot of guidelines to help you to deploy your application on Heroku. So it should not have any difficulty. Okay. Okay, now move to the Node.js part. So what is it? Um, so Node.js is an open source cross-platform runtime environment for server-side and networking applications. So now it is drawing a lot of attention on developing uh, server-side and networking application that requires high uh, inter that that is that uh, supports the in interactive applications. And if you use Node.js to develop your app, then your application should be written in JavaScript because it's because Node.js assumes that you use JavaScript as the programming language. And actually, Node.js uses the Google, Google V8 JavaScript engine to execute it, the JavaScript code. And what is so special about Node.js? There are two features that you must understand. The first one is event driven architecture, and the second one is non blocking I.O. And I will talk about this later. And basically, the idea is to use one process for all concurrent connections. So I only have one process and actually only one thread. And the, the, good, the good thing of having this architecture is that it optimizes an application's throughput and scalability. And to compare, uh, Apache web server, the server we have using for a lot for a long time. Apache uses process and thread based architecture which is relatively inefficient. Because when a new connection comes, Apache will create a new thread for each new connection and each thread is up some system resources, so it is relatively inefficient. In con in contrast, Node.js does not do so. It always use one thread to handle all the connection. So this is the first feature of Node.js, event-driven architecture. Uh, this figure uh, uh, explains everything. So this is my Node.js one time. It is a single thread uh, uh, application. 
and it is it is attached to with a with an event queue. So when a new connection comes, a new event is emitted, and this event will be inserted into the event queue. And the Node.js runtime keep execute uh, keep extracting events from the event queue. And also, as a developer, you need to you need to register a, a set of event handler to handle these events. So when Node.js runtime extracts events from event queue, then it checks that if you have already registered an event handler. If it can find a, 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 an event handler here, then this then your event handler will be executed to handle these events. And when it finish finishes, if it works, then it extracts the next the next events in the event queue. And this loop co continues to loop and until all the events in the event queue is handled. So this is what I call event driven architecture. And the second part is about non-blocking I/O. So first, you need to know what is blocking I/O. Actually, in your OS course, you have already experienced that. Uh, this is your process thread, and this this thing is in user space, and we have the kernel space to handle all the system calls. So when my process or when my program called F read, when it call F read. Then it will check us. Uh, it will exec, uh, call a function, a system call, call the read system call, and the, and it will goes into the kernel to read the file in the file systems. And then when, when the file is, when the kernel finish finish reading the files, then this function returns, the read function, uh, the read system call returns, then you can continue to do your work. So when the kernel is reading your file, this process is blocked because it is a blocking I/O. It needs to change from user space to kernel space. So when the when the CPU is at kernel space, you cannot do anything in your own process. This is blocking I/O. This part is blocked. And for non-blocking I/O, this is again my process thread in the user space. When I call read. Then I will tell the kernel that I want to read the file, and then this function call immediately returns. Okay, so during the kernel is reading your file, you can do other things here because your process is not blocked. You can do other things here, and when the kernel finish finishes reading your file, then it triggers an an event. So your process knows that the, the the file is ready, and the kernel will trigger will will emit a, an event and trigger your event listener. You need to register an event listener, and then your process can read the file using the event listener. So this is non-blocking I/O. When the kernel is reading your file, your process is not blocked. This is the main difference. Okay, so these two concepts, event driven architecture and non blocking out, is very important in JavaScript development, or more specifically, Node.js development. And how can we use Node.js to, to, to start a HTTP server? Actually, in Node, it already include, includes a HTTP server, so you don't need to create, you don't not need to set up a uh, 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 HTTP server like Apache or Nginx or IIS. You don't need them. You can use this code to create a new HTTP server. Oh, so small. So you can uh, read the code in server.js. This is my first uh, Node.js application. I'm going to create an HTTP server. First of all, I need to add, include the HTTP module, and then use the module to create a server. And to create a server, you need to register an event listener, a, a, a callback function, 
when the server is created, it will execute your, your callback function. And it takes two parameters. The first one is request representing the user request and the response representing the server's response. Let's say I want to return hello world to the user. So I first write the header, I set up the status code as 200, and the content type is plain text, and then I include the payload, which is hello world. That's it. And then I can uh, I can open a listen port. Let's say I want to use the 4140 port, and the IP address is this one. So I can use this code to create a HTTP server. So let's see how to do it. Now I'm going to execute my server.js, and I use the node one time, so I need to use this command, the node, and then the script name. Okay, and go back to the browser, and go to go to this URL, and it will return hello world because this is my response. So you can only see hello world here. So this is a very simple HTTP server. Okay, now we will learn Node.js by doing a set of exercises. So this this set of exercises is adopted from this page. Learn you know you can also download this this program. This is an interactive program for you to learn Node.js. So you can download the you can use npm install to install this application and then you can try to finish all the exercises. So the first exercise is uh, the first exercise is very simple. This is a Hello World program. You need to write a program that prints a test Hello World to the console, which is the standard out. And offici officially you cannot use alert. So you need to make use of this API, the console API. You just call console.log and then what will what you want to print on the console and you finish the first exercise. And this is the command for executing the, the code, the script. Okay, this is the your first exercise, very simple. The next one. The next one is to write a program that accepts one or more numbers as command line arguments and prints the sum of those numbers to the console. So for example, when I execute node and then program.js, the script, and then one, two, three, your program should output six because the sum of these three numbers is six. So I want to write this program. First, you need to know how to read the command line argument from in Node.js application. Um, inside a Node.js application, you can read this array, ARGV, from the global process object. So for example, I, if I execute console.log and then process.argv, your argument vector, then the output is like this. First one represents the Node.js runtime and then the script, the path of your of your of your script, and then your command line argument one, two, three is all here. And now I want to add these numbers, but these things are all strings. So we need to first convert it, convert the strings into numbers with this function number and then the string. So this is the solution. Um, yeah. So I read from the second element because the this this one and this one is not my my argument. It is the not runtime and uh, the not runtime and then the script path. So I don't need them. I start from the second element and then I read until until uh, read to to the uh, to this element to, to the last elements in the array. So I read all of them and then add add the value of the arguments into this variable 
and the output is the number. So this is very straightforward. Okay, the next one. The next one is to do our, do our first I.O. But let's start with something you are familiar with. That is a blocking I.O. We are going to use blocking I.O. first. So now we are going to write a program that uses a single synchronized file system operation. A synchronized means uh, blocking, which is the same. You first read a file and then print the number of new lines it contains to the console. So you need to count how many new lines are is in the file. To do this, you need to use the FS module in the node core library. Now let's go to this page. So how can I know that? How do I know which modules do the Node.js provides me? I can go to the Node.js official site and then see the documentation. And let's say I'm using this version of Node.js. So I click on it to see its APIs. There are lots of them. Now, because I want to use file system function call, so I click the file system. And there are lots of functions you can use. And OK, now I want to read a file, so I use this one. This is the synchronized version of with file. Go back to the slides. Oh, I forget to talk about this. You first need to load the FS module into a variable. I think in the lecture, it already covers the use of require. This is a singleton pattern. So you require the FS module in your Node.js application, and then you can use the file system module. Now I want to read a file using some blocking blocking system a uh, blocking file system method. So I call fs fs is my file system module and then dot read file sync. Then it will return you a buffer object. As this function returns, the buffer the file content is already ready in the return value. Because this is a blocking IO, so its return value is the file content. As it returns, the file content is ready for you to use. And as the return value is not a string, it is a buffer object in Node. So you need to first uh, convert it into a string. You can call the to string method on this buffer object. Let's say buffer dot to string, then you can get back the string, and then you can do the string operation on this string. Now I want to count the number of new lines in a string. So you use the split method. Split method is not something in the core library. It is in the JavaScript standard. So it, you can use it without uh, uh, loading any module. You can just call this function and then split using uh, a new line character as the delimiter. Then the string will be split into an array when it sees, when when this function sees a new line character, then it will become a new element in the array. So after I talk about a lot of the the the, the hints, this is the solution. It is actually very simple. First, you need to include the file system module, and then call the refile sync function and pass the, uh, the directory path into this function and get back the return value. This is my buffer object. This is the return value of this function. So this, so I want to read the file content, so I first convert it into a string and then split using the new line character and convert it into an array and count its length and then output the result. And don't miss the minus one because the last line, the last line of this string, uh, the file, the last line of your file does not contain a new line character, so you don't need to count it. Because in this array, the last element is the last line of your file, but this line do not, this line, 
does not contain a new line character, so you don't need to include it. So I use I minus one here. Okay. So the next one, the next one is more important than the last exercise. This is my uh, this is our first asynchronous I/O in a Node.js application. We are going to to have a block at a non-blocking I/O. And the program, uh, the problem setting is exactly the same, except that we need to use a use a not blocking IO. So I use this function called fs dot refile instead of refile send. I use this one. Basically, this one is the asynchronous version of this function. And the difference is that this function, the refile function, returns with without blocking. So when this uh, function returns, you cannot read the file context yet because it is still reading. When when the file contents are ready for you, then it will execute a callback function. So when you call this function, you need to also pass a callback function which can be called when the I.O. completes. And this concept is extremely important in JavaScript programming. And actually when you learn JavaScript, you have already see these patterns a lot. We always use a callback function to execute something. And the signature of the callback function is like this. The first parameter is our error. This is to represent an error. And the second parameter is the buffer object. So this buffer object represents the file content. And in this function, it also accepts an additional argument called options. When you pass UTF-8 into this argument, then this function will automatically convert the buffer object into a string for you. So you don't need to explicitly call the buffer dot to string function. You just pass UTF-8 here, and then when the, when the callback function is executed, this data is already a string. You can use it directly. So this is the solution. First, I include the fs module, and then call the refile function. And first, my first argument is the is the file input path, and then utf a is the option, and then this is my callback function. And inside this callback function, I just do, I just do a split, and then count its length, and then minus one, which is exactly the same with. Uh, the last exercise. So this is our first asynchronous I/O. The only difference is that we cannot use the return value. Instead, we need to pass a callback function to get back the value. Okay. The next exercise is filtered ls. Actually, this one is uh, very similar to the last exercise. We are still using asynchronous I/O, and and now we want to create a program that prints a list of files in a given directory to the console, but it is not printing all the files in in the directory. You need to filter the results by the extension of the files. So let's say I pass the first argument as my directory name, and then the second argument as JPG, then your program output should only contain JPG files, no other things, no TXT or no PNG, something, something like that. You need to filter by the file extension. So how can we do it? Similar to exercise 4, we are still using the file system module, but now we are using another function, using the read directory function. And we also need the path.extension name in the path module to extract the file extension of, of a file. So we now use another module called path. We need two modules. And this is the solution. First, I include the file system module and then include the path module. And, uh, and then I call fs.read directory. The first argument is the input path. And then I callback function again. Yeah, the callback function. Data is 
the array of all files in this directory. So I need to read the uh, read the list of files from this array, and I'm using a for each function to read the array. So the meaning is that when I read this array, I rely on for each function and the input callback function to read the file. So let's say my data array has three elements. Then if I call this function like this, then this callback function will be executed three times. For each time when the callback function is executed, the, uh, the first elements in the array is passed into, into the, this callback function. And we, when the function returns, it will directly execute the next uh, directly execute the callback function again, but the parameter change changes to the second element in the array. And the next time this callback function is ex ex executed with the third element in the array. So this callback function is executed three times. And inside this function, I check the file extension of the input path. So I use the path module dot extension name and then the input path. Uh, the file path and I check if it is equal to what I want if it is the file extension I want then I print it to the console otherwise I ignore this element so this is the use of the for each function and actually this function will be will be covered in the coming lecture this is a, a common pattern in functional programming it is included in is the lecture and then the last set of slides on JavaScript and somewhere here after buying uh, yeah here functional programming over array so this is what I just talked about the for each function so it invokes the callback function per element This show you the use of this function. Okay, so this is uh, the first five exercise in this set of slides, and in the next tutorial, I will continue on from this page. I will tell you how to make a Node.js uh, uh, script into a module, and some other exercise that will be useful for your assignment too. And I will also cover the. Oh, where's the page? Uh, yeah, I will also cover the Express Web Framework to help you develop your assignment tool in the back end, and also WebSocket and Socket.io. So see you. Uh, see you next week.